Hello. We are announcing a brand new giveaway for 75,000 subscribers. All you have to do is obviously follow me. We are giving away one lightsaber from Art Sabers. They are sponsoring this giveaway, so what you have to do is go to the pinned comment down below, follow Art Sabers on Instagram, like their image, and tag two of your friends, and you will be entered into our giveaway. We will be doing this giveaway until we hit 75,000 subscribers here on PPSW. Thank you again for your continuous support. Our story begins in 45 BBY. Two Jedi were sitting in the same class of about 25 students. There was a special guest coming in. The guest was a teacher, but not just any teacher. He was the greatest teacher of a generation. The doors opened, and in walked a little green Jedi. Everyone knew this Jedi. It was a Grand Master, Grand Master Yoda. The Jedi Grand Master was here to teach a class, instruct this new generation of Jedi, as he did with every generation. This particular class was just like any other. There were those who excelled and those who struggled. In the middle of the class, there were those of two students. Both of these students were 12 years old, sharing the same birth year being 57 BBY. They both looked at each other when the Grand Master came in. They had a little rivalry. They knew each other because, as all students in the same class, they grew up with each other, and both of them being brought to the temple a mere month apart from the other. Though they weren't exactly close, Satine was a bit more competitive of a Jedi. Not in a cocky or arrogant way, but she wanted to succeed. The seat made next to her was competitive in a way, but he couldn't really be competitive because he was at the bottom of the class. Some Jedi were late bloomers and it looked like Obi-Wan Kenobi would be one of those students who peaked later in life. Satine, on the other hand, was a high achiever. She worked really hard and she did really well with her classes, but she also excelled in just about everything else. She had a rivalry with Kenobi because she was just rather competitive. It was within her nature as a Jedi, and she expressed it in a peaceful way. She wasn't hesitant about being competitive with Kenobi, and she didn't feel bad about it when she beat him in a spar or anything else. This naturally would sound very un-Jedi-like, but she was truly intertwined with the ways of the Jedi. Her competitiveness came from the wanting of being the best Jedi she could be. She believed in the Jedi, and she believed in the idea that being the best Jedi she could be could help the most people that needed her help. If she could succeed as a Jedi, then she could succeed as a bringer of peace. Next to her was Obi-Wan. He kind of struggled a bit, and he was picked on from time to time. He wasn't a bad student, but he wasn't all together at this point. He tried very hard, it was just something that wasn't clicking within him. Which wasn't his fault in all actuality. Sometimes the force wasn't concentrated together within a given individual, and it would take time for that process to complete. For example, Jedi Master on the High Council, Plo Koon, had a midichlorian count of 13,000, which in reality wasn't as much as some of the other council members or simply other Jedi within the Order, but it was a highly concentrated midichlorian count, which meant he could access more of the force than others with even a higher count than him. Kenobi had the same midichlorian count as Plo Koon. However, it was wasn't concentrated like Master Plo's was. Satine's midichlorian count was around 11,000, but it was highly concentrated, which allowed her to excel at a young age. It was a gift to her, and because of that gift, she remained at the top of her class, constantly topping off one of the other girls in her class, Shock T. Being that these younglings were 12, they were only a year away from becoming Jedi Padawans, which was a huge goal to reach. Ironically, the only two students who didn't pick on the bottom of the class student was Shock T and Satine, being that they were the top of the class. Though it didn't mean that Satine wouldn't naturally be competitive with Obi-Wan. Regardless, the Grand Master came in and began to instruct the class, telling them of all the things they needed to be prepared for when the time came for them to complete their trials. Yoda was with them when they all got their kyber crystals. That day was a rough day for Satine. Typically, she was the first one able to accomplish her tasks, and yet, she was the last one to find her kyber crystal. Obi-Wan was the first. He struggled with everything else, so how could he just emerge with the crystal first? It was simply because he struggled a lot. He knew how to face his fears and to face the things that would hold him back. Satine, on the other hand, was the last student out, getting out just before the ice fully melted to the bottom of the structure. She felt so disappointed in herself, but it urged her to work harder, not realizing that she needed to be focused on something else, arguably more important, that the Force worked in mysterious ways. Sometimes it would test her more than other times. Satine focused back in at the class that Yoda was teaching. She had zoned out, and now she was back in, looking over the board and looking at Obi-Wan. He was focused on what Yoda was saying, but on his little Jedi tablet, Satine saw a little drawing. It was a Jedi holding a lightsaber above his head with majestic robes floating behind him. Satine grinned at it before turning back to Yoda. It was cute, but odd, considering someone in Kenobi's position should have been more attentive to the instructions. When the class was over, everyone bounced, and Obi-Wan was the last to leave. This wasn't uncommon for him. Typically, Obi-Wan got to class and instruction about 20 minutes or so before it started, and he stuck behind for about 5 to 10 minutes after it ended as well. Satine didn't pay any mind to it, but she did notice it. 
Obi-Wan was soaking in all the information he could. Just like any other Jedi, he wanted to be the best, to serve on the council with Master Yoda and help the people of the galaxy. The stress was if he could actually pass his trials or not. For a year, he would continue to struggle, but overcome his adversity at every turn. That is, until the day of the Youngling Trials. The day where he would become a Jedi Padawan or lose the opportunity and have to restart and wait for another year, especially if a Jedi Master didn't select him regardless of his passing or failing. Obi-Wan was the last one up. Typically during the trials, the student at the bottom of the class went last. Yes, it was nerve-wracking, but it was so the student could watch the others and take in everything they were doing. Satine was the first one done, and she was sitting on the bleachers with everyone else in her class, watching Kenobi go last. Obi-Wan stood in the middle of the room. In front of him were the High Council members, currently consisting of Masters Terra Sanube, Opo Rancis, Yoda, Yaddle, Plo Koon, Sifo Dyas, and a couple of other notable faces. To Obi-Wan's left, there were a number of Jedi Knights and Jedi Masters, ready to select their first, second, or even third students. And on the right, there were his classmates, all eagerly waiting for their chance to become Jedi Padawans, all of them having passed the trials, waited for Obi-Wan. His struggle wasn't in usage of a lightsaber. That part of the trial was actually a breeze for him. But when it came time for him to use a force, it wasn't the same. Kenobi was a slender boy, and completing this part was the most difficult task of the training for him. He used a force, but it wasn't as effective as he would have liked. In some parts, it looked like he was an average student, and the rest, it was below average. Obi-Wan's mental toughness was peak, and he squeezed by his trials and returned to his seating. One of the kids who was trying to warm up the shock teen Satin joked about Obi-Wan's performance and nudged Satine on the shoulder. She didn't care for it and she just glared at him momentarily before turning her attention back towards the center of the room. The younglings were called up to the middle of the room and they were told by Master Yoda to await their selection process. Student after student were picked. Shock T was one of the first students to get picked. By the middle of the class, Satine hadn't yet been picked yet. Shortly after the midway point, Obi-Wan was selected by a student who was trained by Yoda's last student. In other words, Qui-Gon Jinn who was trained by Master Dooku, Dooku being Yoda's last student. Satine was awestruck. She couldn't believe it. After a couple more minutes, she stood there in the middle of the room, looking over and seeing all the happy faces in the crowd, every single member of her class, a Jedi Padawan before her. This was one of her first real tests of mental toughness. She heard a soft voice call her name. She looked over and was surprised to see the elegantly beautiful Jedi Knight, Adi Galia. Adi asked Satine if she would like to become her apprentice. Satine's eyes lit up like the sun in the middle of the galactic core. She was so enthralled and jumped with joy, walking over and joining her master. With the ceremonies underway, all the Padawans would get used to their new teachers, and they would all begin individual training with their teachers. Considering Qui-Gon was a little unorthodox, Obi-Wan was immediately ushered into the underbelly of Coruscant. Qui-Gon saw Obi-Wan's great potential, and believed that it wouldn't take much to get the boy to live up to it. So, he forced Obi-Wan out of his comfort zone, being that the most growth happens when one is uncomfortable. Satine, on the other hand, got used to the more elegant ways of the Jedi, being that Master Gallia was hyper-focused on Satine's desire to consistently be the best. Satine's competitive nature was a bit of a worry for Adigalia, and so she tried to see what she could do about getting it out of her. Not that competition was necessarily bad, but it wasn't exactly the best thing for a Jedi to be. Adigalia would restrict Satine to temple life for an extended period of time. She saw many of her classmates, actually no, all of her classmates leave the temple before she did. In a way, she felt like she was being punished, but it was a massive blow to her self-esteem. Satine dealt with it accordingly, and she had to admit that there was some spite in her, some frustration, especially being that Obi-Wan so frequently got out to go on missions with his own master, when Satine was simply stuck without anywhere to go. This would carry on for months until Adi Gallia took Satine out of the temple. She was so excited to finally get out of the temple, and then realized the purpose of the lesson. The reason she was restricted was so that she could learn everything she needed to learn about herself. It was the need for patience. Her enthusiasm was perfect, her skills admirable, her toughness strong. She was likely to be a great Jedi, though she needed more patience, and she needed to trust the process. Master Gallia's main focus on Satine was to enjoy the journey. The end of the road would eventually come, but it wasn't here yet, so there was no need to dwell on it because it wasn't here. When Obi-Wan was in the temple, the two of them would continue their friendly little thing. It would usually be in the form of sparring, and the true travesty was that Obi-Wan was growing and he was starting to beat her at her own game from time to time. In a way, Satine encouraged it because she was so competitive herself, and losing made her challenge herself even more. 
But it was getting hard because after months went by, she began to challenge Obi-Wan out of spite, out of anger, and even frustration. It was very unlike a Jedi, and it was even very unlike her, to which Obi-Wan tried to express an olive branch when she denied it out of frustration. She was hellbent on cracking the code. How could the worst student of her class excel so much? Was it her? Was it her master? Or was it Obi-Wan's master? It just didn't make any sense. One day, when Obi-Wan and Jin departed for the underbelly of Coruscant, Sistine snuck out of the temple to follow them. She was highly invested in this. When she got down there, she was all alone. She wasn't a very big person, being 14 and a girl. Without her master by her side, she was afraid, jarred, and unconfident. She wasn't aware that she got herself into this situation the way she did, but she followed closely behind Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan without them noticing. The only reason Kenobi never noticed is because he was busy listening to everything Qui-Gon was telling him. The two of them went down here for a discreet mission, to find and capture a gun runner. This particular individual had a bad habit of stealing lightsabers that didn't belong to him, and the Jedi were here to bring him the justice. However, the two Jedi were very unaware that this gun runner was prepared for them, tipped off by his henchmen who had been trailing Satine for a number of minutes. After alerting their boss, they jumped after the young Jedi. It surprised Satine because she was too focused on following the Jedi. When she was pinned against the wall, she used her knowledge and her strength to wiggle her way out of the situation, using the force to throw one of the men into the wall and igniting her lightsaber to cut through the other man's weapon. When she calmed down, she heard blast of fire. Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon were caught in a trap. Satine turned the corner and heard a thermal imploder explosion. She then saw a Jedi rope fly backwards and slam into a wall. Qui-Gon was still standing, Satine could tell because of the green lightsaber. She got up and ran over to the body. It was Obi-Wan. His face was covered in ash and soot, and he was knocked unconscious. Jin saw Satine and tried to figure out why she was here at all, but at the same time he was too focused on defending his young Padawan and the other one, so he couldn't take his attention away from the confrontation. The Jedi Master spun his blade around, blocking every strike. He called back to Satine and told her to get Obi-Wan out of there. She nodded her head and lugged him up over her shoulder and slowly got out of the way. When she got behind cover, she lowered him to the ground and felt his head. He was out cold, but he was still warm, still alive. Another explosion went off, the sound of blaster fire died down, and then the sound of a lightsaber deigniting could be heard. Qui-Gon ran out of the corner, seeing Satine checking on Obi-Wan. He had a decision to make. Should he report this to Adi Gallia, or should he let it slide? Qui-Gon knelt down and asked Satine to watch out. He grabbed a hold of his apprentice and picked him up. Qui-Gon told Satine to walk with him as they got back to their shuttle and got Obi-Wan back to the temple. The Jedi Master walked with Obi-Wan in his arms and Satine by his side. He told her to tell him why she came down here. She admitted she was frustrated. She believed that she should have been able to explore on new adventures and be the Jedi she thought she was worthy of being. She admitted her jealousy and her frustration and even her anger. Qui-Gon understood. He placed Obi-Wan down inside the vessel that they arrived in and put some Bacta into his arm. He then turned over and asked Satine to sit down with him. Master Qui-Gon told her that the Force is as it wills. He suggested that everything happens for a reason, so see this particular time in her life as a trial. Something that didn't need to be fought, but to be accepted. She was a strong young woman, a strong young Jedi. She was very capable, and she was very worthy of high accolades. But they would never find her if she didn't accept what sat before her. Qui-Gon told her that he wouldn't tell Master Gali about her decision to come down here. He understood Satine's determination, and he respected it. He didn't want her to be punished for having it. After all, she was Mandalorian, and they were known for their stubbornness anyways. Qui-Gon told Satine that because she saved Obi-Wan in a stressful situation, she showed how much of a Jedi she truly was, worried more about the health of another ally rather than the excitement of a firefight. Satine's mouth hung open, realizing what Qui-Gon was saying to her. Qui-Gon smiled and patted her on the back gently, telling her to get back to the temple before he got there. She grinned and leapt up to her feet and ran to her ship, lifting off and flying back up to the surface. A couple days later, Satine would be sitting inside the medical facility next to Obi-Wan's bed. She was truly worried for him, and so when she wasn't training or learning with Master Gallia, she'd be here in the medical bay. She often would find herself falling asleep near or around Obi-Wan's bed. She didn't want to leave his side. She had always felt a connection to him, but part of her felt a tad bit of responsibility for his injury, as if she distracted him with her presence in the Force. That wasn't the case. It simply was a pirate throwing a thermal imploder at his face, and him blocking it at the last second with his lightsaber, therefore exploding it. When Obi-Wan woke up, Satine jolted from a half-asleep state and came over to his side. He looked up with a lot of confusion. He wasn't really sure where he was. The lights were bright. The first thing he knew was that he was next to Satine. The last thing he knew is that he was being hit with a grenade. Satine asked how he was feeling. 
He looked at her and then grinned, telling her that he was doing all right. She was happy but unhappy, so she smacked him on the shoulder, the same shoulder that took the brunt of the hit. He asked what that was for. She told him it was for scaring her. She gave him a little peck on the cheek and told him that she was glad he was all right before leaving to go grab his master. If Obi-Wan wasn't confused already, he certainly was now. He felt a bond between him and her, but he never really thought about it. He acknowledged it because she never seemed like she wanted to put his head through a wall like she did the other younglings, but he just figured it was because she felt bad for him almost as if she was doing it out of pity. Regardless, the next couple years would see a number of adventures for the young Jedi. The first real big adventure for Satine would be her return to Mandalore and Kalvala, where she'd protect her sister Bo-Katan Kryze from assassins. Bo-Katan was following partially in her father's footsteps. Being that Satine was taken to the Jedi Order, Bo was technically the first in line to the throne of Kalvala and therefore Mandalore, soon to be Duchess Bo-Katan. Bo, adopted the peaceful nature of her father's political affiliations, but also the warrior path that was very prevalent with her family. She was a bit of a warrior with a peaceful motivation. Satine would protect her sister for the longer part of a year, and then she would return to the temple. The next couple years would continue, with growth between young Kreese and young Kenobi. Their bond had its ups and downs throughout this time period, especially being that when they didn't see each other, they were a bit off. They functioned really well around each other, and it wasn't like they had the words to express how they felt about it. They just assumed it was a friendly interaction, but truthfully, it was an attraction that they had. Being that they were Jedi in their early 20s, they had no real semblance of what attraction was supposed to be. They just knew that they felt how they felt, which was something was missing when they were apart. And when they were together, everything felt just right like home actually. To others within the Jedi, they just assumed close friends. But if you could see how much their pupils dilated when they were facing down each other in a game of hollow chess, or the subtly flirty grin that stood between every spar, maybe it was a playful pushing and shoving. They never thought anything of it because it was something that naturally developed into after Obi-Wan's accident when they were 14. Satine made the first move, a simple peck on the cheek, but nothing could spur the heart like that. Obi-Wan thought about that moment and it sent his heart into what felt like a solar flare. Satine felt the same way about it. As they grew up, Satine moved away from the lightsaber. She kept hers, but she moved away from its constant usage. Her lightsaber emitted an emerald color and it matched her elegance as a Jedi, but she did aspire to set herself apart. Her focus in the late teens revolved around information, which was inspired by Master Gallia and her friend Obi-Wan, but it was fully embraced by Satine. If Satine didn't embrace the studies of the Force, then it likely would have never happened. Because of Satine's growth as a Jedi over the past several years, she was permitted to take her trials so that she could become a Jedi Knight at the age of 22. Satine took her trials. Obi-Wan was there watching her, emotionally cheering her on in silence as he observed her trials. Satine's first attempt at her trials would have her passing with flying colors. Obi-Wan was incredibly proud of her for becoming a Jedi Knight at 22, which was a great accomplishment. But now, she was a knight and she didn't know what to do. Obi-Wan suggested ideas for her, like going to former Jedi temples around the galaxy and studying at them. She thought this would be a good idea, though admittedly she didn't want to miss Obi-Wan whenever he was around. She looked forward to him returning from his missions and enjoyed spending quality time with each other. When they were both at the temple, they studied together, they worked together, they sparred, they understood each other. They were as close as Yoda had ever seen to a dyad in the Force. They may have truthfully been a dyad, but no one was even really that sure. Their bond through the Force was as tight as their emotional bond, though they were both Jedi and they didn't show it. From time to time they expressed it physically through a tight hug or a sneaky cheeky kiss on the cheek, very rarely on the lips. This was kept hidden of course, only did they do that when they were in their own solitude. They were Jedi, they couldn't be seen showing such emotions to each other. They both knew this, and yet they resisted the code like a plague. With Adi Gallia joining the ranks of the High Council, the Council began to keep a close eye on the two young Jedi. The reason being is that they were them. I mean seriously, they were inseparable. The two of them were always with each other. In the year 32 BBY, when both of them were 25 years old, Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon would be dispatched by the Supreme Chancellor Valorum to resolve the Trade Federation's blockade of the peaceful planet of Naboo. When the Jedi got there, it was an obvious trap. Through a series of wild events, the two Jedi would learn that the Sith had returned from what seemed like extinction, they found a boy with a higher midichlorian count than Master Yoda, and they rescued the Queen of Naboo. Before returning to liberate the planet of Naboo, Qui-Gon would bring the boy before the Jedi High Council, informing them he believed the boy was to be the one that brought balance to the Force. The Council was very skeptical of this, and so they declined Qui-Gon's request to train Skywalker. Regardless of the debacle, Satine, being a Jedi Knight, would volunteer to assist in the recapture of Naboo. 
She had, since her early days, become less aggressive, and she was going to assist the queen solely. She was there for support, essentially, and that was the role she defined herself as. She didn't want to be anything more than support on this mission. When they eventually got to the hangar bay, she broke off with the queen to help her recapture the throne room, while Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon fought the Sith assassin. While the Jedi dueled with the talented Zabrak Sith, Satine helped Padme Amidala and her security force recapture the throne room. While Satine was with Padme, she felt the shock in the force and immediately worried about Obi-Wan. Being that the throne room was captured, she dismissed herself, telling the queen that the Jedi were in danger. When Satine got down to the lower level, she ran through the hangar doors and down a long pathway. She could see the red doors in front of her. At the back, she saw the Sith assassin standing over the edge, looking down. Next to him, a little ways away, was the body of a Jedi. Satine's heart sank into her stomach as she sped up, getting to the first barrier and waiting. She waited patiently, trusting the Force, and then the doors began to open up. She watched as another body leapt up from beneath the Sith pulling with the force and igniting a green lightsaber. The Sith assassin turned around and then got cut into two pieces. Obi-Wan stood over, watching as the Zabrak fell into a bottomless pit. Obi-Wan didn't hear the doors opening and the doors closing behind him as he ran over to his master's side. He listened to everything Qui-Gon said to him before he died in Obi-Wan's arms. When the final door opened, Satine called out Ben's name and ran over to his side. He looked at her, trying to make it hard to tell that he was crying, but he couldn't deny it. She got down next to him and wrapped her arms around him, looking down at Qui-Gon, seeing that Obi-Wan's master had passed away in his arms. She felt so terrible for Obi-Wan, wishing that she could have been here to help. She really liked Qui-Gon and believed that his death was a terrible disaster for the Jedi Order. Obi-Wan shook his head. He couldn't believe what just happened, though he was incredibly thankful for Satine being here. Still the weight of his master on his lap, Obi-Wan buried his head into Satine's shoulder, where she held him gently and rubbed his back. Within the span of 24 hours, Qui-Gon would be burned here on Naboo, and the people would celebrate their liberation. Obi-Wan would become a Jedi Knight, and then immediately after, he would become a Jedi Master, following in the footsteps of his promise to Qui-Gon Jinn. On the journey back to Coruscant, Satine told Obi-Wan that she couldn't technically help him, but she would be willing to help him with Skywalker. She told Obi-Wan that she believed it was a bit much of an undertaking for him to take. She knew Ben was resourceful and intelligent, but Skywalker was a student who had never been taught in the ways of the Force and he was predetermined to be the most powerful being to ever wield the power of the Force. If that power got turned to the dark side, then it could sign over the end of times for the entire galaxy. The journey back to Coruscant would give Obi-Wan Satine needed alone time where Obi-Wan would communicate to her how his emotions were tearing him apart. He understood his responsibility based on the promise he made, but he wasn't entirely sure if he was ready to accept said responsibility. Satine knew this was something that was beating Obi-Wan up, a feeling of unworthiness, but Satine had his back. She always had his back up until this point. The two of them were sitting in a cargo area next to a window, looking out into space. She grabbed Obi-Wan's hand and called him Ben, telling him that she would join him no matter where he went. Obi-Wan questioned what she meant, but she explained it. She would be with him throughout this entire process. She would be by his side. Sure, it wasn't permitted by the Jedi Council or the Order, but when did they listen to the rules? Obi-Wan smiled softly at her, the burden and the pain of his master's loss still close at his heart. Satine took Obi-Wan's hand and kissed it. The two of them sat across from each other, holding hands. Obi-Wan closed his eyes and meditated as did Satine. The two of them bonded not just through the Force, but through the physical touch of their hands being held together. It connected them to each other's essence, and it allowed them to find a serenity in the Force together. Satine reassured Obi-Wan that he was more than ready for his task. He didn't need to worry about failing because everything he did would be beneficial to Skywalker in some way, shape, or form. Though Satine, while on his trip back to Coruscant, would ask about Skywalker. She would learn through Obi-Wan's description that Anakin's mother was a slave and that the boy himself was a slave too. Satine hadn't realized that there were still slaves around the galaxy because truthfully, no one knew about them and those that did weren't closely intertwined with the Republic or the Jedi. It was a get-rich business and the Huts and the Zygerians exploited every little bit that they could of it. Satine suggested that the two of them go to Tatooine and find Anakin's mother and free her. It may have been outside of their limits, but Satine recognized that if Skywalker was at all an emotional kid, then he would likely be extremely emotional to the fact that he escaped slavery, but his mother didn't. So Satine, after returning to Coruscant, would go out into the Outer Rim and pay for Shimi Skywalker's freedom. She would also give her a handful of credits transferred from Republic into Outer Rim currency so that she could begin a new life as a free woman. Satine also did something that she thought about while she was on her way here. She gave Shmi a Jedi communicator so that she could get into contact with her son when he was of age to have his own communicator. Of course, being that Satine had the frequency, she told Shmi to keep the device on at all times so that she could get any communication from her son. Though she had one request, 
That was that Shmi would not call the temple, Obi-Wan, herself, or Anakin unless it was an absolute emergency. Aside from that, the Jedi were not to know about this because if they knew, then it could get Satine and Obi-Wan in severe trouble, being that Jedi business was extremely exclusive. Shmi understood. She was just happy to have a line of communication to her son, and she was also happy because she wasn't a slave. Satine returned to the temple and informed Ben of everything she did for Skywalker. He was incredibly thankful, but he admitted that chances are if he had to face this by himself, he would have never thought about doing either of the things that Satine did. Satine just smiled at him with a twinkle in her eye and a glimmer in her teeth. That's what made them a good team. They both made up for the other. Their bond was truly remarkable, and it would continue as such while Skywalker went through an accelerated version of Youngling training. At the end of Youngling training, Anakin would be taken under Kenobi's wing. For Anakin, he knew something was up. Of course, he was able to talk to his mom from time to time, which was a luxury, and he was very content with this teaching situation, but there was something up with these two Jedi. He didn't know what it was, but Satine and Obi-Wan had a thing, an unspoken thing, but it was a thing for sure. Truthfully, Ben and Satine had fallen for each other. It was too hard for them not to. Their connection to the Force, along with their affection towards each other, made it impossible for them not to think about each other. Sometimes Satine would be dispatched on her own missions, which were totally fine, but when she was gone, Ben missed her like none other. It'd be similar whenever Obi-Wan and Anakin were on assignment without her. When they were together, they were electric, entirely reminiscent of a legendary diet in the Force. As Anakin grew up, he could never put a finger on it, but he observed their dynamic. Ben and Satine talked about it in their secret language. It was almost like they were able to talk to each other while on the other side of the temple or even on the other sides of the galaxy without the need of communication or a communication device. As if they were inside of each other's minds, reading the words that they were thinking before they were spoken. As Jedi, they weren't meant to have such affection for each other, but it was impossible to deny at this point. Currently, Skywalker was 19 years old, and both Satine and Obi-Wan were in their 30s. The galaxy was tensing up. Both Satine and Ben weren't fond of the current state of the Republic or the Jedi. Mostly because they seemed to be beckoning a war from the other side, and Satine, while being a Jedi, admitted she wasn't exactly fond of the idea in participating in a galaxy-wide war. Obi-Wan agreed with her sentiment, believing that there were no need for a war, but he couldn't control the actions of the Republic, the Separatists, or the Jedi. Because of Anakin's healthy relationship with Obi-Wan and Satine, he wouldn't be pulled towards the darkness, and when Obi-Wan and Anakin were stationed to protect the Senator Naboo, they did so with great skill. This inevitably leading Anakin to be sent to Naboo with Padme, and Ben and Satine to go on a mission by themselves to investigate this Jango Fett and the apparent clone army, leading them to Kamino, and then from there to Genosis. The two Jedi took a Jedi shuttle, rather than starfighters. On Kamino, they revealed the location of the clone army to the Jedi Council. Satine admitted that this wasn't looking good, but there was something entirely wrong with this situation. They both agreed that something about this entire situation was wrong, whether it be the disappearance of Master Sifo Dyas that happened 10 years before, or just something else. Everything felt out of place. When the two Jedi got to Genosis, they snuck around until they were ambushed, after alerting the Republic and the Jedi to their location and what they found. The two of them found a massive droid foundry. Dooku would have both the Jedi locked up in a cell, and he would confront the two of them and act as if it was all a mistake. He would continue suggesting that they join his cause and defeat the Sith, being that the Dark Lord of the Sith was in control of the Galactic Republic. When Dooku left Satine and Obi-Wan, they talked about the possible implications of what that could mean. There were no logical sense about that statement. Also, how could they trust someone like Dooku? Surely it was a ploy to have the Jedi act out against the Republic and suffer for their negligence. The two of them tried to escape until they were taken from their cells and placed in the middle of a Genosian arena. Obi-Wan couldn't believe it, but after a couple minutes in place, his apprentice and senator of Naboo would be brought out to join Obi-Wan and Satine. It turned out that while they were safe and secure on Naboo, Padme suggested that they come and rescue Obi-Wan on Genosis. Typically, Obi-Wan wouldn't be frustrated, but he was, because Anakin was endangering the senator. Not that she couldn't fight for herself, but bringing her here was a bad idea. There were worse problems ahead, though. The line of a beast to kill the captors were elite. A reek, an acle, a nexus, and a very nasty animal to the four sensitives called a Vornsk. The Vornsk was a wolf-like animal from Akur, and they naturally developed the ability to defend themselves from the forest. Padme was able to get herself up onto the top of her platform, while the three Jedi separately prepared for their foes. Satine saw her opportunity to move 
up the side of her post. When the Vornsk got to her, she held the chain tight as she got off the pillar and used it to propel herself away. At the same time, Anakin was going after the Reek, and the Ackley was trying to chop Kenobi in the sushi rolls. The Jedi were able to deal with the animals, and Anakin was able to use the Reek as transportation for the four of them, until they were surrounded by battle droids. Though, it wouldn't be the end for them, as 200 Jedi showed up inside of the arena to assist the captors. With the Jedi here, they had every chance to succeed, and a massive battle began. Jedi were dying left and right, and there were thousands upon thousands of battle droids present. Obi-Wan and Satine used each other to stay safe, fighting back to back. At some point during the conflict, Mace Windu joined the two of them, putting his back up next to the two of them. The three Jedi operated smoothly until they and the remaining survivors were captured by the droids in the middle of the arena. When all looked lost, the clones arrived to save them, and the Jedi fled the arena into the front lines of combat. Anakin, Satine, Padme, and Obi-Wan were in the same vessel, eventually chasing down Count Dooku and following him to his hideout. Skywalker, having been trained by a balanced force of Satine and Ben, would be patient, listening to Obi-Wan, who took the center stage, telling Anakin to go on the left. Together, they looked at Satine. She was already moving in on the right. She knew what Obi-Wan was going to say before he said it. The three lightsabers illuminated the darkened cave. Dooku loved a good challenge because there were very few beings in the entire galaxy that could genuinely challenge him to a duel. Very few had his skills and his talents. He grinned, waiting for the Jedi to move on him. They did so patiently. Skywalker and Satine did at the same time. Dooku's speed, even in his old age, was unmatched. Deflecting a shot made by Satine before shooting lightning at Skywalker, throwing him against the wall behind him. Before Dooku could turn his attention to Satine, he was thrown back by Kenobi. Obi-Wan and Satine raised their blades together. Obi-Wan would be especially weak here. He knew that because Dooku was an infamous Form 2 user, and Form 2 typically was the Achilles to Form 3. He was especially aware of this because Satine used Form 2, and she wiped the floor with him regularly, so they stayed wary of it. Obi-Wan had time to notice the pattern of Dooku's movements as it was similar to Satine's and he switched from Form 3 to Form 4. The two Jedi moved around Dooku. He blocked every advancement they made. He was well familiar with Kenobi, being that Qui-Gon always sung his praises. However, Satine was a little bit of a lesser known Jedi to him. Dooku soloed Obi-Wan after kicking Satine to the ground. Obi-Wan blocked all the strikes, but then switching back into Form 3, which was more comfortable for him, to only have his arm and his leg cut. Satine looked up, and so did Anakin. Dooku raised his lightsaber over his head to strike down Kenobi, but from behind him, he was lifted off of his feet and thrown into the wall, his body covered in yellow electricity. Satine looked in awe, terror, and shock as she got up and ran over to make sure Dooku didn't get up. Anakin and Satine ignited their weapons and stood over Dooku. Shortly after, Yoda would arrive and the four Jedi would collectively capture Count Dooku at the Battle of Genosis. He would be brought back into the Galactic Core and he would be put in front of the entire Galactic Senate and be placed and tried in a maximum security prison with the aid of the Jedi. Palpatine was so beyond disappointed because he couldn't do anything to change this. The Republic was already outraged by the decision to betray the Republic and they wanted Dooku locked up for good. Palpatine was in a bind here. The Separatists were without leadership and there was chaos within their ranks which led to a fallout between the two largest fleets. The first fleet being commanded by Admiral Trench, which was arguably the largest fleet in the CIS. The second fleet being led by General Grievous, which was the Malevolence and a couple of support ships. The Clone Wars may have begun, but the Separatists were bickering for control over the power gap that Palpatine himself couldn't fill as a mysterious figure that was in charge of Dooku. This infighting would lead to the total destruction of several Separatist fleets, and Admiral Trench barely would emerge victorious against the Malevolence. The only reason he won was because of his superior strategic skill set, though it would cost the CIS the Malevolence, several Lucre Hulks, and entire fleets. Instead of the Jedi Temple, Anakin Skywalker would pass his trials, and while he spent a good amount of time on Naboo with Padme, he and her hadn't started a relationship aside from their friendship. Being taught by what he assumed was a healthy platonic relationship from Satine and Ben, he saw it as a normal thing to exist, so that the bond between Padme and him formed really healthily. With Anakin as a Jedi Knight, Obi-Wan would be promoted to Jedi Master and join the ranks of the High Council. Satine, who was a major contributor, would be recognized for her efforts and be offered the final spot on the Jedi High Council next to her master Adi Gallia, though there was a bit of inner turmoil for Satine. She didn't like the idea of serving the Jedi in a war, and she was feeling like it betrayed the moral code of the Jedi. 
Obi-Wan agreed with her sentiment and suggested that if she joined him on the High Council, they could act as one. The Council saw her use of electric judgment as a reason to bring her aboard the Council. It was a rare ability, a gift from the Force if you will. The moment Sabine showed the ability to use it, her kyber crystal color molded into a yellow blade. Aside from the Temple Guards, she was one of the first Jedi since the era of the High Republic to wield such a color. The Council saw the duo of Kenobi and Kreese as something that they needed on their Council. After both of them accepted their roles on the High Council, they discussed how being on the High Council made them feel. Ben was content with it, but Satine in a way was overwhelmed by it. She wanted to help the Jedi and the people of the galaxy, but wasn't sure of her stance inside of the Order. Though Obi-Wan, as always, had the right words to say, he was able to assure her of her choice and her path of a Jedi, suggesting that the Force chose her, which would explain her lovely new lightsaber color. She understood where Obi-Wan was coming from, but it still stressed her out a bit. She wanted to be the best version of a Jedi she could be, and she believed that the Clone Wars could very well change that for her. The Clone Wars themselves immediately fell off the deep end. With the infighting in the CIS ranks and the newly constructed Grand Army of the Republic, the Grand Army of the Republic would march into the Outer Rim under the command of Jedi Generals, and they would wipe the floor with the CIS. It was effectively the worst thing that could have ever happened for Palpatine. It's not that the droids didn't outnumber the clones, it was more so the fact that the droids decided to pick fights with each other. Well, not the droids, but their organic leaders. The Trade Federation, the Commerce Guild, Techno Union, and the rest of the lot began to tear apart their council when a civil war began between their ranks. The civil war caused the CIS to be extremely weak, and with the clone legions and armadas bouncing down into their territory, they couldn't defend themselves after fighting with themselves. The only one able to stand up to the Republic was Admiral Trench, who at this point had been the de facto leader after beating General Grievous, which lasted very shortly when Skywalker and Yularen turned his capital ship into dust over Christophsis. Satine and Ben would propose to the Council an investigation on the chance of the Republic, the two of them deciding that what Dooku mentioned on Genosis could be true. Being that Palpatine was trying to slowly elicit more power into his hands, which in turn wasn't working as well as he would have liked. The Republic was constantly victorious, and Sidious couldn't rally the Separatists, and the war looked like it was over before it began. While Palpatine had begun the Grim Skywalker, he didn't get as far as he would have liked, and Anakin, because of the good relationship with Satine and Ben, didn't look for guidance anywhere else. Truthfully, he found it kind of odd that an old man was so interested in him at a young age. Anakin willingly volunteered the spy on the Chancellor when Satine asked him about it. Satine and Anakin's bond was very much so like mother and son. Because of Satine's actions to keep Anakin and Shmi in contact with each other, he warmed up to her a lot faster than he did Obi-Wan. She was a balance in their dynamic of leadership. The fun parent, if you will, and the not so fun parent. Obi-Wan was stern, sassy, and sometimes a bit rough. Satine was stern, sassy, but she was a lot more lenient on Skywalker per se especially because she understood his struggles a bit more having watched how people treated Obi-Wan when he was an adolescent. Regardless, while Anakin was on his secret mission, Obi-Wan and Satine, after years of continuing to admit their feelings for each other in secret, would officially continue their relationship in secrecy. This only assisted them in determining that they were in fact a dyad in the Force, something as rare and as powerful as someone like Skywalker himself. Individually, they had not a chance to compete, but together, they were just like him. Of course, being that all three of them had grown since Genetic, they were really ready for whatever the Sith threw at them. Skywalker would determine that Palpatine was a Sith Lord, but they wouldn't do anything about it. Without emergency control over the Grand Army of the Republic, Palpatine was unable to do anything within his own power. With the peace treaty come to an end, Padme would put a vote of no confidence on the Senate floor, which would effectively remove Palpatine from office, being that he wanted a military creation act and didn't really use it, wasting billions of Republic credits that could have gone to refurbishing the Outer Rim or the Mid Rim. The moment Palpatine was out of office, the Jedi quickly asked acted, subduing him and killing him mercifully. With the Sith gone, the Jedi would remove themselves from the Republic military and would continue to assist in the peaceful endeavors their order was built for. Ben and Satine would never be found out by the Jedi, keeping their relationship a secret until the accidental birth of their daughter Astrid Kreese Kenobi. That would send a ripple through the Council. Just the Council. The Order would never find out about it. The Council had to make a decision. Most of them would have voted to remove the Jedi. But Satine and Ben were a diet in the Force. They were incredibly special. And also, especially since at the time of the birth for Astrid, Anakin was on the High Council after teaching Ahsoka to become a rank of Knight, which meant that there were already three votes in favor of Satine and Ben. Not to mention Adi Gallia, who taught Satine, and a number of other Jedi, seeing the benefits of such a child being born into the Order. The big reason they weren't removed was simply because Satine and Ben acted like they didn't have feelings for each other. Of course they did, 
but they acted like the birth of Ashton was simply the result of toying around, if you will. With the chosen one, a dyad, the child of a dyad inside of the Jedi Order, all abstaining to the ways of peace, the galaxy would be set for a future of justice for all. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our epic story today. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Tiger Boy, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Jedi Sloth, Mad Men Azuz, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, George Wright, Flynn Vassis, the man with three first names, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Smash 2,000 likes on the, you know, do the thing. We're going to talk about the story. You know what to do. Um, also, lightsaber giveaway. Don't forget about that. Pretty cool. Going away, free lightsaber. You want a free lightsaber? Lightsabers are cool. You know, you could bash younglings with them. Anyways, let's about the story. So, um, this was fun. Now, I didn't go into Mandalore too much, and uh, my assumption, and I, I kind of laid it out for you guys to presume, um, but I, I'm, I set up Mandalore with the little arc, like where Satine goes and Obi-Wan's place, essentially. That Bo is like a warrior, but she's also a leader, like a peaceful leader. And so it's kind of like Bo from The Mandalorian. Spoilers if you haven't seen it. <laughs> but that's, that's that. Um, so covering that task immediately. Um, the story itself is more so about Satine. It is. Uh, what if Satine was a Jedi is literally about her. And so focusing on Mandalore wouldn't really do much for her. Um, she is technically the first Mandalorian Jedi uh, since uh, Vizsla, but I didn't want to focus on the Mandalorian Jedi aspect of it. I think it's a cool concept, but I didn't want to focus on that because I, I wanted to focus on the character of Satine, and that's something I always try and do, is all these videos are like character studies, especially ones focused on characters in particular, and they're always trying to get a greater grasp of the character. Um, and so something I wanted to cover was the adolescence of Satine, because she's Mandalorian after all, so covering how she would be as a Mandalorian, and being as a Mandalorian as she is, I'm suspecting that as a child she would be very, very um, aggressive, if you will. And I wanted to cover how that transitions into being a Jedi and how she would transition into becoming a Jedi, you know, a Jedi, in the, uh, a Jedi that she was at the end of the story, one with a yellow lightsaber, one that's like certified her strength in the Force as well as her strength in her lightsaber skills, you know? And using electric judgment is something that I thought would be really kind of cool for her to do, something unique to her, something that's unique to Plo Koon, which is, you know, guys, I love Plo Koon. So, you know, it. I wanted her story to feel unique. I wanted it to be like a very unique story in this story. Being that we've done love stories with Obi-Wan and, and Shock T before, I wanted to do this particular story um, and, and almost build it in a different direction and make, make Satine feel grounded as her own character, first of all, because that's what she is in the story. She is technically the protagonist. And I wanted her to feel like she had this uh, emotional weight with her so that you can they can really go along with her through this journey. As she becomes, what, what we discover at the end of the story is diet in the force um the the one thing that might be controversial is the jedi keeping obi-wan and satine in the order after they have a kid um and that's 50 50 i mean you could really say you know it was it was a bad decision like the jedi wouldn't do that or you could just say like the jedi like if satine and obi-wan are just like oh yeah we don't really feel anything for each other but we were just you know having fun <laughs> you know then <laughs> then you know that that i feel like they'd just be like okay whatever you know kids will be kids even though you're like 30 you know so you know i hope you all enjoyed this this was a fun video i love making videos with satine and obi-wan they're my favorite couple in star wars so i have lots of fun with these stories and i always want to make them different because you know the last one with obi-wan and satine on mandalore was a lot different than this one and so i wanted to um convey that you know i wanted to convey the difference in build of story and um it was heavily inspired by uh some of my favorite characters from my favorite other franchise, which is Astrid and Hiccup. Noticing similarity there, Astrid, Kreese, Kenobi, uh, that's, it's, um, without me saying that, maybe you wouldn't have noticed, but, um, it was, it was heavily inspired that, that relationship growing up through the time period, like going up from like adolescence to adults was heavily inspired by their relationship because it's very, it's a very healthy communicative relationship. And that's something that I think Star Wars lacks a bit of. I think Kanan and Hera is a great great form of communicative relationship um but aside from them <laughs> there's not a lot of great examples but i hope you all enjoyed if you did smash the like button you know what to do great video coming out tomorrow i love you all spread the love and always remember my friends may the force be with you